last 13 years, I've worked with visual artists. I've also worked with the paintings, sculptures, prints, posters, and films that they've produced. I think of myself as a museum curator. What I've come to believe is that art museums can be transformative places for how we communicate, where there's a space for dialogue, and specifically where we can not only understand something about ourselves, but about our culture and the culture of others. But always, that's been mediated by artists. I want to take you guys on a little journey. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to pretend that I'm blindfolding you for a car journey. Um, we might need a bus, because there are a lot of us, but the point is, we're going to be blindfolded for about 45 minutes. And this is what you see when we take the blindfold off. Um, it's also what I saw when my parents blindfolded me when I was 13 years old. Um, I was in the car, and we lived nowhere near the beach, but I could start to smell the sea air. And I said, oh my goodness, are we going to the Getty Museum? And I know, I was kind of an odd teenager who <laughs> really wanted to go to a museum. By the time I was 12, I'd become obsessed with Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. And while my parents couldn't afford to send me to Italy, what they could do was get free admission to the J. Paul Getty Villa, which you see here. And in the 1990s, it still housed Getty's collection of art and antiquities. Now, if I rewind us back to that bus journey, someone else who was on that bus with us, also blindfolded, was my 13-year-old best friend, who I should admit now is way cooler than I ever was or will be. And she gave the perfect teenage response. Who wants to go to a museum? And so, when we got here, I was very self-conscious about apologizing to her, making sure that she was okay, that we were in this place, even though I was having a really good time. And she said she'd never seen a museum like it. And we both had this phenomenal day um, here in these gardens, as if it were Etruscan Villa. So two black girls who'd never before left their home country could feel that they belonged, could have this sense of another time, another culture, another place, through the art and the objects that were there. But crucially, one of the things that artists have taught me is that it's not about the building or the gallery within the building or even the white walls within the gallery. What's most important is about creating space where art can be seen and where artists can be heard. And when I think about that sense of belonging, this is something that's recurred throughout my practice. I've had the most privileged position to be able to talk to and learn from artists. And in relation to thinking about that sense of belonging in an art museum space, I'm reminded of a quote by Durban-born artist and activist Zanelli Moholy. In her film, Difficult Love, at one point she talks about her background, about growing up in a place where there was no culture of going to museums and galleries, um, that there were no museums and galleries to, to go to, that culture was found elsewhere. Um, indeed, she even emphasized that museum was not part of her vocabulary. But I think artists can help us develop a new vocabulary for how we think about the experiences and dialogues around art and culture. And this is crucial because in places like South Africa, and perhaps throughout most of the African continent, where there certainly aren't the same types of art and gallery infrastructures that we have in the global north. The aim is not to replicate the syntax of a European or an American art museum. The idea is to see what works in a specific location. And it's artists who've really pushed me to do that. In conversation with the artist Lerato Shadi, I've talked a lot about what it means to belong, or to feel perhaps that you don't belong in an art museum context. Um, the museum advisor and educator, Elaine Gurian, has talked about this notion of threshold fear. And it's a term that's taken from psychology. 
And what it refers to is, exactly as it seems, um, perhaps an aversion or a reticence to cross over certain thresholds. And it may not be that the barriers are physical. It may not be that a door is locked. It may be that you feel a certain place isn't the type of place that you go. I mentioned that I think of myself as a museum curator. Some people may think that they're not art people or museums aren't places for them. And one of the things that Lorato admitted to me, and I found this incredibly poetic, she was saying that she often had to steel herself, sort of ready herself emotionally and psychologically if she were going to an art museum. And she talked about what she called a gentle violence that can sometimes happen. And this can happen in many ways. It may be in relation to um, the, the glorification of a colonial past. It could be the carelessly written museum label that ends up being offensive. It can also be being the only black body in a museum space. And I know what that gentle violence can feel like firsthand. So what's the alternative? Artists have always pushed me to think differently. They've always challenged my thinking. I've got one preconceived notion. I think this is going to work really well. It's going to be great. And then often, I'm able to think differently about how I behave or what I assume because of it. And so again, to come back to that conversation that I had with Lerato, she said, you know, what if it were possible to behave differently in museums? You know, what would be so wrong with speaking up? for there to be movement, for you to not be afraid to speak in hushed tones or touch things, for there to be music and movement. And this brings me to another important museum experience in my life. Um, when I was a young child of about four or five, I had easily the experience that I credit with making me love museums. And it was at the now defunct Capitol Children's Museum in Washington, D.C., on H Street. And what I remember is that one of the exhibits looked like a Mexican town square. I'd never been to Mexico. But what was key about this was not the recreation of the edifice or the tiles or the fountain that was bubbling water. It was the fact that they taught us to sing a song aloud in Spanish. We ground corn flour and made tortillas, which we got to eat. And like these children sitting here at this table, they had a large um, volcanic mortar and pestle, and we ground chocolate so that we could make hot chocolate to drink. So if I think back to the vocalizing, the touching, the eating and the drinking, all of those are things that are normally forbidden in art museums, aren't they? And I feel again, and it's happened particularly in contexts like the very dynamic art community here in Johannesburg, that there are all of these other ways to create space, to make room for dialogue. And an image we have here, um, I took on my camera phone, so I'll just talk you through it a little bit. It's a performance that happened at the corner of Kirk and Nugget Streets in 2014. This was on December 8th, which, as many of you will know in this room, um, was the day of prayer and reflection. So referring to um, the state-issued memorialization of Nelson Mandela's death the year prior. And what we have wheat pasted is the title of the work, Digging Our Own Graves. Um, and the performance was a collective work put on by the Artist and Curator Collective, a center for, uh, for historical reenactments. And the person that you have crouching down in the front is an artist and healer by the name of Albert Koza, and he's lighting candles before an altar of fruits and sweets. Um, it was very powerful to be there on that day because it became a way of, by the artist's own admission, thinking about how you might approach the rhythm of a lost or silent song. It was also a way of thinking about how we memorialize and how we remember. Um, the event was advertised um, on Facebook, so a group gathered there in New Dornfontein um, that was primarily artists, curators from the Johannesburg area, me too. Um, but what was fascinating was that this performance opened up and embraced a space for what was not possible, what you couldn't necessarily account for or plan, and that was the interested passers-by 
the sex workers, and the New Dornfontein shoppers who stopped and gathered and also watched and witnessed this performance. And in terms of creating a sense of belonging, it was those residents and the people who were already in that area who belonged even more than those of us who came specifically to see it. Now, I mentioned the notion of threshold fear, but there's something else to think about, and this is how we each feel that we can or cannot relate to contemporary art. And I think language has such a lot to do with that. And if we were to caricature it, on the one extreme, we can dismiss it. My five-year-old could do that. And then on the other extreme, perhaps we've got the parody of, oh, it was fabulous, darling. It's the best thing I'd ever seen. This effusive praise for things that no one can quite get their head around. Um, but somewhere in between, like with everything else, there's the truth. And there's a fascinating moment that occurred, again, in my own life, when I took my five-year-old daughter to see the work of Kemeng Walehuleri when he had his first exhibition in the United Kingdom last year. And she is five years old. She said, five, she said four words to him, actually. I like those dogs. And I know it's easier to say, okay, well, it's a five-year-old, so you can say something honest and simple, and people will appreciate you and pat you on the head. But she did something else. This is a detail of one of the works. And she asked a question I didn't think to ask. She asked the artist, where's the dog's body? And he took her deeper into the exhibition and showed her that the dog's body was part of another work. I wouldn't have known that. Maybe if you stood there, I could talk you a little bit through Kamang's biography, about his larger body of work, some of the themes that he was working with, but there's no way I could have answered that basic question. So, I just want to leave you with the idea that sometimes, maybe your five-year-old could do that, and that's okay. That's enough as a starting point for you to feel that art and artists are welcoming and that we can all learn and speak this language together. Thank you. Thank you.